For centuries, humans have been interested in learning about the wonders of space, but it wasn't until the 20th century that we were able to learn about space from space. The first man-made object to reach space was a V-2 missile, number V-177, launched by German scientists on the 20th of June, 1944. Number V-4 was at the time considered to be the first rocket to reach outer space. However, it only reached an altitude of about 90 kilometers. That's below the Kármán line, which is considered to be the point where space starts. It wasn't until the 4th of October, 1957, that the Soviet Sputnik 1 became the first satellite to achieve orbit. The first man to go to both space and orbit Earth was Soviet pilot and cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. On the 12th of April, 1961, age 27. Gagarin was in space for one hour and 48 minutes aboard Vostok 1 before safely returning to Earth. Since then, there have been hundreds of missions with the aim of learning more about space, including the Apollo moon missions, planetary landers and rovers, space stations, and deep space probes. There's a difference between going to space and getting into orbit though. If you launched a rocket straight up to higher than the Kármán line at roughly 100 kilometers, then that rocket would be considered in space. However, just like when you throw a ball up in the air, the rocket will just fall back down again. Getting into space is relatively easy. Amateur rocket enthusiasts have achieved it, but getting into orbit is much harder. To get into orbit, you actually have to travel sideways, not upwards. The reason you go upwards is to avoid obstacles such as mountains and, more importantly, to get out of the atmosphere. Below about 160 kilometers above sea level, the atmosphere is too thick to maintain orbit as the air will slow down the rocket. The rocket would have to be constantly burning its engines to maintain orbit, which would require an unfeasible amount of fuel. A simple way to understand how orbits work is to imagine that the rocket is constantly falling towards the Earth, but it's also moving forward so quickly that by the time it would hit the ground, the Earth has curved away beneath it. Here's an animation to demonstrate this more clearly. The red dot represents an object trying to achieve orbit. As you can see in the first two attempts, it is moving too slowly so it falls and impacts the ground. However, going faster the second time, it travels further. On its third attempt, you can see it has traveled fast enough that by the time it would hit the ground, the Earth has curved away beneath it. The object has not slowed down though because it is above the thickest of the atmosphere. This means that the object will continue to follow the same path until it is either slowed down or is accelerated, which is what leaves it in orbit. When a satellite or other payload is put into orbit, it is launched on what is known as a launch vehicle or launcher. To maintain low Earth orbit, which is between 160 and 2,000 kilometers above sea level, the satellite must be moving at at least 7 kilometers per second, which is over 15 and a half thousand miles per hour. Though the exact speed depends on the target orbit, this is the reason rockets are so large. The tallest, heaviest, and most powerful launch vehicle ever used is the Saturn V. The launcher used by NASA during the Apollo program and at 110.6 meters tall, 10.1 meters in diameter, and weighing in at almost 3,000 metric tons at launch. The cost per launch of the Saturn V was approximately $113 million in 1969 to 71, excluding the cost of the payload, which is around $710 million in the present day. The mass of Apollo 11 was about 45.7 tons at launch, only about 1.5% the mass of its launch vehicle. The launch vehicles make up the vast majority of the mass of launches. However, when considering research costs, construction, materials or resources, etc., they're usually considerably cheaper than the payload. The cost of a launch vehicle is typically about 10% of the total life cycle cost of a typical satellite payload. As launch vehicles are relatively cheap, in the past, it has not been worth the cost of researching and testing reusable launch vehicles as the technology was too advanced. It is becoming much more viable and even more a necessity now to develop reusable launchers as it can massively reduce launch costs. 
It's the same principle as airplanes. A plane is not destroyed after one flight. If they were, then the cost of flights would be too high for most people to afford. For launch service providers, the cheaper they can make their vehicles to launch, the more customers they're likely to get, provided it doesn't increase the chance of a failed mission, which is why some private companies are developing reusable launch vehicles. The Space Shuttle, officially named the Space Transportation System, is the most well-known reusable launch vehicle being in use from the 12th of April 1981 to the 21st of July 2011. The Space Shuttle Orbiter would launch vertically attached to a large fuel tank and two solid rocket boosters, SRBs. The Orbiter itself didn't carry fuel for the main engines, it all came from the external tank. The shuttle lifted off with over 30,000 kilonewtons of thrust, which is the equivalent thrust of over 25 Boeing 747s. Two minutes after launch, at about 46 kilometers, or 150,000 feet, the two SRBs were jettisoned. They would then descend under a parachute and land in the sea, where they would later be recovered to be used again. About 10 seconds after main engine cutoff, the external tank would jettison, but would not be recovered as it broke up in the atmosphere before impact. The orbiter used small thrusters called the Orbital Maneuvering System OMS, to complete its orbital insertion. These would also be used to make adjustments to the orbit and to de-orbit the orbiter at the end of its mission. When the orbiter was in the appropriate orbit, it would release its payload. The space shuttle was also used to rendezvous with the International Space Station to deliver crew and payloads and was used to launch and work on the Hubble Space Telescope. When the orbiter had completed its mission, it would deorbit and re-enter the atmosphere at over 20 times the speed of sound, creating an extreme amount of heat from compressed gases. The bottom of the orbiter is made up of heat-resistant carbon tiles to prevent damage. This is what was damaged on the Columbia shuttle, which caused it to disintegrate on re-entry, killing all seven crew members. The orbiter would then glide down and land on a runway like any other plane and would deploy a parachute to slow down. At this point, it could be recovered and service to be used again. Despite having over 130 successful missions, the shuttle program was not considered a success by many people. The total project cost of the Space Shuttle program was over $200 billion. For reference, the Saturn V's project cost was $6.4 billion in its time, or about $41 billion in the present day. The cost of a shuttle launch was also between $450 million and $1.5 billion, so despite its reusability, it still cost a lot of money. The originally envisioned cost of shuttle launches was about $54 per kilogram of payload, which is the equivalent of about $300 today. By 2011, the estimated cost of shuttle launches was approximately $18,000 per kilogram. That's 60 times the original planned cost. The Space Shuttle is considered to have failed to achieve its promised cost, safety, and utility goals by many people. The shuttle was also originally said to be capable of launching every week. However, shortly after the shuttles were first used, it was realized that this was an unrealistic expectation. Over 30 years, 125 missions were launched, averaging to roughly one launch every three months. Although technically reusable, the shuttles were practically rebuilt after each launch. The main engines were very complex and required a lot of maintenance. After each flight, they had to be removed and thoroughly inspected. Before the engines were upgraded to what were known as the Block 2 engines, the turbo pumps, part of the engine for pumping the fuel, had to be removed, disassembled, and overhauled after each flight. Because in many cases, there would be no way to abort the launch and ensure survivability of the crew, such as in the event of a failure with an SRB, it was imperative that all systems worked perfectly without fail. This led to a labor cost of about $1 billion per year for around 25,000 workers in shuttle operations. In a 2007 paper, Dr. Michael D. Griffin, the administrator of NASA at the time, which is the highest rank in the organization, argued that if the Saturn program was continued, it could have provided six manned missions per year, two of them to the moon, at the same cost as the shuttle program, with the additional ability to launch infrastructure for further missions. In the same paper, he also said, if we had done all this, we would be on Mars today, not writing about it as a subject for the next 50 years. 
we would have decades of experience operating long-duration space systems in Earth orbit and similar decades of experience in exploring and learning to utilize the Moon. SOAR is a partially reusable launch system concept from Swiss Space Systems, S3, that is currently in development. It's similar to the Space Shuttle, but smaller, unmanned, and launched atop an Airbus A300. This type of launch vehicle is officially known as a space plane. SOAR will begin attached to the top of an Airbus A300, which will take off from a standard runway. After reaching sufficient speed, SOAR will disconnect and continue to accelerate and climb towards space whilst the A300 returns to land. Inside SOAR is a third expendable stage, which has been contracted to be developed by the Russian firm RKK Energia. With this third stage, SOAR will be capable of launching up to a 250 kg payload to LEO. At about 80 kilometers, the third stage will be deployed and SOAR will glide back down to land on a runway where it can be recovered and prepared for another flight. The third stage will then carry the payload into orbit before releasing it and returning to Earth where it will burn up in the atmosphere. S3 plans to focus on assembly, integration and ground testing of its small satellite launcher in 2016 and 17 before testing a full flight of SOAR in 2017. This in preparation for its first commercial launch in 2018. An S3 spokesperson said, We are in the last year of our research and development program in January of 2015. S3 plans to spend 250 million Swiss francs, which is about $247 million to cover all costs up to the first small satellite launch. Head of S3 USA Holdings Inc. said the list price for a launch to take up to 250 kilograms to low Earth orbit up to 700 kilometers would be 10 million Swiss francs or about $9.86 million. S3 had said they were going to offer zero G flights in 2015 in order to gain employees' experience operating the A300 as well as creating revenue for the company. These flights have since been postponed due to serious financial difficulties that include missed paychecks for salaried employees. S3 have also said that they offered to certain customers to convert their zero-G tickets into company shares. In the next few years, we will see if S3 overcomes the setback in order to provide cheap launches for many companies and organizations with small payloads. United Launch Alliance, ULA, is a joint venture of Lockheed Martin Space Systems and Boeing Defense, Space and Security. Founded in 2006, ULA provides spacecraft launch systems for U.S. government launches, including for NASA and the Department of Defense. ULA recently released their concept of a partially reusable launch system dubbed Smart Reuse, or Sensible Modular Autonomous Return Technology, which is intended to be used on their next launch vehicle, Vulcan. The Vulcan launcher will launch in the same way as other rockets by lifting off vertically from the launch pad. When the external solid rocket boosters run out of fuel, they will be jettisoned while the rest of Vulcan continues towards space. After the first stage has run out of fuel, it will separate from stage two. The engines will also separate from the tank. The first stage tank will not be reused, only the engines. ULA claim that this will take up 90% of the propulsion costs of the booster. The engine will then deploy in an inflatable heat shield to protect it from re-entry. After slowing down sufficiently, the heat shield is separated. A power foil is then deployed from the engines to reduce its terminal velocity further, and as it descends, a helicopter will catch it mid-flight. Depending on launch trajectory, the helicopter will then either deliver the engines back to the launch site or onto a waiting ship. The engine can then be analyzed and serviced before being reused for another launch. ULA planned to launch Vulcan for the first time in 2019, but sources say that the reusable technology may not be fielded until as late as 2024. On the 17th of September, 2015, ULA announced that they will pay Blue Origin, a space organization led by founder of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, to complete development of a new engine to replace the current Russian-made RD-180 engine that powers the first stage of the Atlas V rocket. ULA Chief Executive Tori Bruno said that the new engine has the potential to substantially reduce launch costs, but declined to be specific. In October 2014, ULA announced a major restructuring of processes and workforce in order to half launch costs. 
One of the reasons for this was competition from SpaceX, a privately owned aerospace business who offer much cheaper launches and are actively working toward making their launchers partially reusable in order to reduce launch costs further. In the market for the launch of US military payloads, ULA has faced no competition for nearly a decade since its formation in 2006. The military space launch arrangement in the US has been called a monopoly by space analyst Marco Caceres and criticized by some in the US Congress. In addition to SMART, ULA is developing the much more revolutionary ACES upper stage, which will be refuelable and reusable in space. ULA CEO Tori Bruno said that they expect it to fundamentally change the way we go to space. In June 2015, Airbus Defense and Space unveiled their reusable rocket concept named Adeline, standing for Advanced Expendable Launcher with Innovative Engine Economy. According to Airbus, this concept could be used on any launcher, however small or large, and is likely to be used on the upcoming Ariane 6 launcher. The rocket will launch as usual vertically from the launch pad. If SRBs are used on the launcher, then they will be jettisoned after burning all of their fuel. After the first stage tank has burnt through its fuel, it will be jettisoned from the rest of the spacecraft, which will carry on its journey to space. Adeline will then separate and begin its ballistic re-entry at over five times the speed of sound. As Adeline reaches the lower atmosphere, it will pull out of its dive and activate its solar-powered propellers to power it to the landing strip. Adeline will then land on a runway like a plane, where it can be recovered and prepared for reuse on another flight. The first stage fuel tank will not be reused. Airbus says Adeline represents 70 to 80% of the total value of the launch vehicle. Development and testing of Adeline began in 2010. After simulator testing, the first demonstrators were tested in various conditions to validate the technical elements ahead of a maiden flight, which is scheduled for 2025. Herb Gilbert, a chief technical officer at Airbus Defense and Space, said that the Ariane engines could be used perhaps 10 to 20 times and that Adeline could generate savings of 20 to 30 percent for a launch. He went on to say that the extra mass does cause a reduction in performance of the rocket overall, but said that this was maybe as little as 10 percent. Airbus have said that they have spent about 30 million euros on its reusable technology program and are planning on testing even bigger demonstrators. SpaceX is a privately owned aerospace company in the U.S. founded by Elon Musk, co-founder of PayPal and CEO of Tesla Motors, with the aim to revolutionize space technology and the ultimate goal of enabling people to live on other planets. SpaceX are currently working towards making their Falcon 9 launcher first stage reusable, and their upcoming Falcon Heavy will also be partially reusable. While Falcon 9 has currently only carried unmanned cargo, in the future both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy will be capable of launching humans to orbit in SpaceX's Dragon capsule. Falcon Heavy will even be capable of taking a small payload to Mars. Falcon 9 will lift off the pad with over 6,800 kilonewtons of thrust with all nine of its Merlin engines firing. This is more than five Boeing 747s at full power. With its nine first stage engines clustered together, Falcon 9 can also sustain up to two engine shutdowns during flight and still successfully complete its mission. Approximately three minutes after liftoff, the first stage will be separated while the second stage carries the payload to orbit. The first stage then uses its nitrogen cold gas thrusters to orient itself towards the launch site before relighting three of its Merlin engines to perform the boost back burn. When Falcon 9 reaches about 70 kilometers in altitude, it orients back away from the launch site and relights three engines again to slow from 1,300 meters per second to just 250. This burn lasts about 20 seconds. To protect from the intense heat, Falcon 9 has shielding on the aft section. The first stage also uses four aerodynamic control surfaces, known as grid fins, to control its trajectory to ensure it lands at the target area. Just before impacting the ground, one Merlin engine is fired up to slow the stage down so that it can land safely. As the stage is very light at this point, because most of the fuel has been spent, the stage cannot hover. Even one Merlin engine at the lowest possible throttle would be too much. Because of this, Falcon 9 must fire its engine at precisely the right time so that its velocity is cancelled out the moment it touches down. This is often referred to as a hover slam or suicide burn. 
Heavier payloads may require Falcon 9 to land on SpaceX's Autonomous Spaceport Drone Ship, or ASDS, in the ocean, as it will not have enough fuel to go back to the launch site. Falcon Heavy is essentially a Falcon 9 with two extra Falcon 9 first stages attached on the side. As a result of this, its launch and landing systems are very similar, only with three cores instead of one. Falcon Heavy will launch from the pad into space like Falcon 9 then. When there is only a small amount of fuel left in the two boosters, they will separate and land in the same way as the Falcon 9. They use their cold gas thrusters to orient, then boost back to the landing site. Falcon Heavy continues onwards until the first stage is low on fuel. It will then separate and land in the same way. Depending on the payload, the first stage may not have enough fuel to land back at the launch site, so will land on the ASDS in the ocean instead. Testing of SpaceX's reusable system began in 2012 with their test vehicle, Grasshopper. In its first test on the 21st of September, Grasshopper had a brief 3-second flight in which it hopped 1.8 meters. This seems pretty insignificant in itself, but was the start of something much bigger. Grasshopper had a total of 8 flights over the course of 13 months, each going higher with the exception of Flight 7, which demonstrated its ability to divert as it traveled 100 meters laterally and then returned back to the pad. For its final flight, Grasshopper climbed to 744 meters before descending on the 7th of October 2013. Grasshopper's successor, the Falcon 9 Reusable Development Vehicle, or F9R Dev 1, was announced in October 2012, although under the name of Grasshopper version 1.1, until early 2014. The F9R Dev 1 had five flights and climbed to 1,000 meters before safely landing. Flight 3 included the steerable grid fins that are on the current Falcon 9. On its fifth flight on the 22nd of August 2014, the vehicle self-destructed as it detected a flight anomaly that began to take F9R Dev 1 off its planned flight path. A blocked sensor causes the anomaly, and there was no backup sensor on the prototype vehicle, although the flight version of Falcon 9 has a redundant backup. There were no injuries as a result of the anomaly. SpaceX also began testing the landing capabilities of full Falcon 9s. On several payload launches, after the first stage separated from the rest of the rocket, they tested soft landing the stage in the ocean, as if there were something for it to land on. The first test was of the 6th Falcon 9 launch on the 29th of September 2013. The stage successfully reoriented, reignited three of its Merlin engines, and successfully performed the first burn and re-entered the atmosphere safely. The stage began to roll because of aerodynamic forces, however, which caused the fuel to centrifuge, and the single engine involved with the deceleration burn shut down. The ninth flight of Falcon 9 on the 18th of April 2014 was the second soft landing attempt and was successful. The tenth flight successfully landed the stage in the ocean with the legs deployed and much closer to the coast to simulate a more realistic landing. The fourteenth flight of Falcon 9 involved the first attempt at landing on the Autonomous Spaceport Drone Ship ASDS. The first stage successfully performed the boost bank and re-entry burns, however hit the drone ship hard and exploded. The ship itself was mostly undamaged. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk later elaborated that the flight control services had exhausted their supply of hydraulic fluid prior to the impact. Another ASDS landing was attempted on the 14th of April 2015 with Flight 17. This time, the stage landed on the ship, but due to excess horizontal velocity, it didn't settle and exploded upon tipping over. Elon Musk later clarified that a valve was stuck so the system could not react rapidly enough for a successful landing. Following a several-month break after a failed Falcon 9 launch, SpaceX attempted to land the next Falcon 9 stage on land back at the launch site. The landing succeeded. When the stage touched down approximately 9 minutes and 45 seconds after launch on the 21st of December, local time. Although recovered, the stage will not be used again in another launch. Instead, SpaceX have been running several tests on the stage. On the 31st of December 2015, SpaceX announced that no damage had been found and it was ready to perform a static fire test, which was conducted on the 15th of January 2016. The test was reported good overall, but one of the outer engines, Engine 9, showed thrust fluctuations. Musk reported that this may have been due to debris ingestion. 
Another landing was attempted on the ASDS again on the 17th of January 2016. The rocket successfully completed all burns and landed on the ship, however, one of the four landing legs did not lock and folded back up after landing, which caused the stage to tip over and explode. Elon Musk said that the cause could have been ice buildup due to fog at launch. On the 4th of March 2016, another ASDS landing was attempted, and again, unsuccessful. Though due to the nature of the mission, a successful landing was not expected. Finally, on their fifth attempt, SpaceX safely landed the Falcon 9 first stage on the ASDS on the 8th of April 2016. In NASA's post-launch conference, Musk said that if the booster completes 10 test fires and looks good, then the stage will be reflown on another Falcon 9 launch for a paying customer. Musk also said that he wants the fairings to be reused as they cost several million dollars each and that he's excited for the Falcon Heavy, which is currently planned to have its demonstration flight in November 2016, where it will attempt to land all three of its first stage cores. Over the coming years, we may see many of these concepts progress into a reality. These will massively reduce launch costs, accelerate our ability to explore space, and learn more about what's out there.